Aloha and welcome to a science and theater episode of 21.3 Degrees North. I'm Jennifer Killinger and I'll be your host for the day and every day. In the studio with me today, I've got Liana to talk about rain gardens. She is an ecosystem specialist and will be telling us how things are being done on Hawaii to uh, help conserve water. We've also got Stephanie Keiko Kong, who is an award-winning actress, and we will be talking about her lovely experiences with that. First, thanks for coming, guys. It's pretty awesome to have you in here. Nice to be here. Uh, let's just get right into it. Um, with so many people on the islands, this is a tiny little island mm -hmm. state in the middle of a huge body of salt water, and it's really scarce to have fresh water. How do we live in balance with water on this island? So that's a great question. So um, part of us being this island in the middle of the ocean, we're very fortunate to have the mountains that we do because the way that the weather moves across the ocean, the water condenses over the mountains and rains down on our island for us to drink. Mm -hmm. And the way that the Native Hawaiians had their land management system set up was very um, it was very important to them. It was, you know, treated as a sacred resource and that the, the system that they had was the um, Ahupua'a system, mm -hmm. which is both a, a government and a land management system that divided up the land from ridgeline to ridgeline. Mm -hmm. So it was wherever their water fell, all of that was tracked through the, through the land and then out into the ocean. So there's people who are responsible for that whole system. And that's really important because everything that we do on the land directly impacts also the quality of the water, but also the ocean out in front of it because it's all one ecosystem. The water that flows over down through the land and underneath it is mm -hmm. connected to the ocean out in front of it and that affects the marine life there. And so, so the water that flows into the bays is greatly affected by what is happening on land in that area. Right. Um, so the balance has shifted dramatically from the times of ancient Hawaiians and how they used to live with the land Mm -hmm. And now that we're so industrialized, what kind of things have been damaged in terms of the water systems? So the way it was done before was you had your drinking water and came from the top, and then that water would flow down through um, their low E fields, through the farmlands, and um, you know hydrate the crops. And then after that, it would continue to flow down, and people would bathe and everything more towards the mouth of the river so that it wouldn't pollute the land further up. And as all that water is flowing over the land, it's percolating back into the soil. Mm -hmm. It's being absorbed by the land again. It doesn't just flow straight off the surface. So the difference with what we have now is we have all this impervious cover. We have all of the pavement and driveways and everything that the water just flows straight on top of. And it doesn't have that time, that slow nature to sink back in through the rock. And when it sinks through the rock, that's also where it gets filtered and exactly. the contaminants get um, kind of a, a absorbed or absorbed mm -hmm. by the soil. And um, Yeah, lava rock is great for that. Yeah, it's, it has a lot of surface area, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does. And the native forests that were here in Hawaii, too, um, it's like a big sponge for all of that water, too. So not only do the vegetation absorb the water themselves, but it creates that um, the shade. Uh -huh. So it uh, lessens the amount of evaporation coming off. So if you have just a big, open, empty lawn, you still have a little bit of that water retention, but it's not the same as having forest cover because it's not as moist, it's not as protected. Yeah, and the sun can just evaporate that right. water. So the way the, like, instead of having all of this water going back into the ground and replenishing that freshwater lens, like we have a really um, amazing, actually, groundwater in Oahu compared to the other islands of this big freshwater lens, which is why we can support such a big population of people here. Mm -hmm. But... Um, instead of it percolating back in and replenishing that lens, it's just flushed straight out to the ocean on the surface. And that's because we have everything so covered with concrete and other things that do not help absorb the water and right. it flushes out. So there is something called the first flush. And that's when the major chemicals and everything on the surface is first washed out. But it's not only during the first rain of the season that you have to be worried about going into the ocean or worried about contaminants being washed down the mountains. Mm -hmm. It actually happens every time it rains, correct? 
Yeah, that's true. The first flush is a big one just because you have that buildup over the dry season of all of those contaminants on land, like all of the oil that comes off of cars, um, trash that builds up from, you know, sideways, shopping centers. And it just goes right to the ocean. Right. Like all of the water that you release from your house, like from your, from your shower, from your sinks, all of that, it goes to a water treatment plant and then is released. Everything that flows off of your yard, off of the street, goes straight into the storm drains and that just goes completely bypassed straight through the ocean. There's no filtration system set up currently. That's amazing to even think that that is allowed to happen. I know. <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around that being okay somehow. It's, it's not okay, but there are things that we can do to help it. Um, but let's first talk about um, the development of the land the sedimentation and runoff increased greatly from developing, right? Right, so uh, it's kind of a compounded problem. So when you have uh, this big flush of water, it picks up all of the sediment, it picks up things like um, yard waste, pesticides, fertilizers, oil from cars, trash, and all the excess nutrients and everything along with it, and all of like, the big pulse of fresh water. So when that all goes into the ocean, you get um, an environment very different from how it would have acted naturally. You get eutrophication, which is right, exactly. the overabundance of things growing from the nutrients that have mm -hmm. been added, and then they die off, and then that sucks up all the oxygen exactly. as they die, right? Exactly. So that's just one thing. That's one thing. You get a lot of invasive algae growth, and the algae, um, their growth rates are a lot faster than corals, so it can completely grow over the corals and smother them. The sediment itself can cover the coral. Mm -hmm. And then you also have this big pulse of fresh water, where it used to be less fresh water in general coming into the bays and into the ocean, so the salinity has changed too. And so when you change that base of the ecosystem, you have more algae and less coral, that changes the types of fish that you get, and that changes fishing practices, which changes the fishermen's livelihood, and it's a whole trickle-up system from the bottom of the ecosystem up. So um, how can we get back to a more natural way and live in balance with the water cycle? How can we reduce pollution? What, what can we do? Mm -hmm. By starting to treat water as a sacred resource again instead of just as a commodity that will always be there and it doesn't have any effect on our actions is the first step. So just you know, reducing what we use, just being conscious of it. You can set up rain barrels at your house so you can use for like outdoor showers. You can use that to water your own garden with. So I've heard some, using... some things on the mainland, I don't know if it's the same here, about people actually getting legal ramifications from collecting rainwater. Do you know anything about that here? Oh, Have you heard that? Interesting. No. I don't know if that's... It should seem like if you can just collect the water that comes off your roof in a barrel and then use that for your own lawn. There might be... The legal aspect might be more for just safety for drinking water if you're not condoning people, you know, doing their own system just because the city doesn't want to get sued. Yeah. But one absolutely legal way to do this is a rain garden, right? Mm -hmm. So um, rain gardens are really awesome. It's just like a normal garden, but it has the extra purpose of aiding in the water flow and filtration. So um, the way the rain garden works is it's a depression in, in the ground, and it's usually set up where water would normally pool. So I live in Manoa, and we live right next to the stream, and I actually have a storm drain right in front of my property, and then I see it all go into the stream in the backyard. And a lot of times, like, I'll get, like, trash and everything in the back. But if I could create this, like, diversion path off the side of that, you let the water soak into the garden, and then the plants that are there, you use, like, native plants that are very um, water-resistant. And not only does the water have a chance to slow down and collect and pool in a natural way instead of just being in a straight concrete channel that shoots it out, mm -hmm. the sediment s settles out, goes to the bottom, and also the plants will absorb the pollutants in the water and you know, bring it into the plant tissue so it's not going out into the water. It provides native habitat, you know, like if you use native plants, it provides native habitat for birds and um, other animals. And then they're also pretty. <laughs> I mean, I mean, what gar adding a garden to any area kind of beautifies the, the space. And um, once it's set up and the plants are well established, it actually doesn't take any extra maintenance because it's collecting the rain. So you don't need to water it. So it's less of an impact than even just having a lawn. So it's not only a positive thing in terms of helping the environment, getting pollution out of the water that's flowing into the oceans through the bays and the freshwater system, but it's also actually literally helping by being there. It's, right. It's pretty. It takes less work. There is nothing bad right. about it. Yeah. <laughs>
So who can build a rain garden? Anyone can. I mean, this could be done at any scale. Like I said, I wanted to install one um, at our house in Manoa. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, this could be a project you could do, like, just a backyard project with your family. If you have, you know, you notice that there's this one area in your yard where, you know, water tends to pool or flood, just turn it into a rain garden. Make plants. Use the water that's sitting there. Um, you Instead could do it of having it harbor mosquitoes Right, instead. exactly, exactly. <laughs> or you could do it at schools and you could get support that way from, you know, parents and teachers in the schools in order to come together to make one at a school. And um, I work for this nonprofit organization called Malama Manalua. And so we do this at um, slightly larger scales in beach parks and also like near shopping centers. And we rely on like a large community of volunteers and some very um, motivated and wonderful community leaders who bring people together to do these projects together. So communities and schools are actually being able to take part in this. It's, it's happening at schools, and kids get to learn a little right. bit about native plants. Exactly. So it's an educational process, and it also helps the environment. Um, we do also sometimes need you know, outside support as far as you know, getting grants from environmental agencies and mm -hmm. that type of thing. But that's for like more large-scale projects where we need excavators to come in and everything. So for a smaller-scale project, um, what kind of work would you put into it? You, would you dig a larger hole and then plant plants? Is there anything more to it? That seems so simple. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to um, create a space first. So you kind of excavate the area, and then you fill it with um, a type of soil that is going to be you know, something that's you know, native to the area, but it's, it's not going to flow off the surface. You don't want to add a bunch of dirt that's just going to move right away. Uh -huh. So it needs to be compacted, and then you want to add native plants to it, and then you put mulch on top. And that mulch helps kind of keep everything in place and also it retains the moisture in the, in the water. So the, the layering soil. of each mm -hmm. ingredient that you're adding to the mix. Right, right. <laughs> there's a lot of, um, like, there's lots of different ways to do rain gardens. It depends on the area, the slope, how fast the water is flowing through your yard. Okay, so there's actually a, a kind of, there's a science to this thing. <laughs> <laughs> there is. It's not too complicated, but there's actually a lot of resources online, too, that, like, I've looked up and other people can, too. Yeah, so we have Milana, say that again? Malama Manalua. Malama Manalua. Yeah. Dot Org, org. Dot org that you can go to to find more about that. Um, and then what else can people do to protect the water? So aside from conserving the water, um, I mean, obvious things, like if you're out and about and you see a plastic bag flo floating around or just trash, like, I know it's not your trash, but just it doesn't take more effort just to pick it up for a second and throw it away. Yeah. If you're um, doing gardening, if you can find alternative organic things to use for a garden instead of just fertilizing it like crazy because you're like, oh, I want you know to use as much as I can, but all the excess of that is just running off. So reducing that. If you're washing your car, wash it on your lawn because that way it kind of sinks into the ground instead of going straight to the storm drain. If you're doing an oil change, use an oil box. Just, just the awareness in general that everything that flows off your driveway is going to the ocean unfiltered. And every little bit helps because it is each of our individual actions that ends up making the larger scale difference. Right. That we and need. when one person knows, you can share that information with somebody else who can share it, who can share it. It's just an awareness. A lot of people, I mean, I, they're not doing it because they hate the ocean. They're just doing it because they're not aware of the effects that they're having. So. I read a study recently that showed that people were more influenced by their peers to be green than any other reason. Hmm. Even if they didn't care about the environment or if they did care, the peer influence was the strongest. So that's a very good idea to yeah, tell your friends and to kind of, you know, <laughs> oh, you don't have a rain garden? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> Well, thank awesome. you so much for sharing with us, mm -hmm. and I look forward to building a rain garden when I get a yard. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, let's move on to you. I you want to talk about rain gardens some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, forget theater. Let's just talk about rain gardens. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> no, but for real, when did you get started in theater? Uh, when I was pretty young. Um, my family is all, they're all scientists and teachers, so I was the weird one, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I have like try interests. I have interest in science, theater, and um, so you're perfect for my show. I guess I love you. I'm serious. <laughs> I would just sit here and talk about rain gardens more. <laughs> <laughs> would you have anything in particular you wanted to say about them that you didn't get to? About rain gardens? Yeah. Um, I, what is it called? Xeriscaping? Um, is that it? Like Xeriscaping? native plants? Yeah, mm -hmm. native plants. Mm -hmm. 
I'm trying to get my parents to do that because they have they have a yard. I don't have a yard. Mm -hmm. I have a, an apartment with a lanai with very strict like don't plant anything up there. Like don't try to make a lawn or nothing on your lanai because yeah. people would like me. So what about doing a theater show on your lanai? You're trying to get that back to theater, aren't you? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Okay, tell us about the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival. Okay, that's <laughs> awesome. That was founded uh, about 12 years ago by Tony Pisculli, and he uh, had this great, big, this great idea to um, bring Shakespeare to Hawaii audiences because that wasn't happening on a regular basis. Like there'd be a, here and there, there'd be Shakespeare shows, but there wasn't a dedicated festival. And there usually is in other in all other, major yeah, cities. Yeah, in all the major cities, and in, in every state has like its own like community theater Shakespeare kind of thing. Um, and it's accessible work. It's public domain. It's not like you have to pay a bunch of rights. Um, the themes are, you know, love, sex, uh, politics, life and death, um, filial piety. So not like, it's not like anybody's debating anything crazy intellectual. It's like life stuff, you know. So even the language is kind of elevated. These are themes that are pretty universal to the human experience. So he was like, all right, I'm, I'm making my own festival. Um, and to sort of turn the Elizabethan tradition of using all male casts on its head every other year, the founder of the festival would direct a show that featured an all-female cast. And that's how I got involved. Yeah, so what play were you in and what was your character and why is that a big deal? Oh, God, okay. So there was a, um, an opportunity for uh, all-female cast um, and the play was Richard III. Richard III, if the audience is not familiar, is Shakespeare's most powerful, heinous villain. It is the only Shakespeare play that is named after its anti-hero. Yeah, it's evildoer, yeah. Like, <laughs> Lear, sort of a hero. Macbeth, sort of a hero. Hamlet, definitely a hero. Richard III, bad guy. So <laughs> the, the um, opportunity was there for me to play a villain, mwahaha, right? <laughs> Um, and I got cast as Richard III. As a female. As a, yes. In an all-female cast. In an all-female cast. Mm. So instead of playing, like, Richardina or something like that, <laughs> it was a, I played a male. So I was, I played a man. I walked like a man. I talked like a, as much as I could, like a man, you know. And you had to hide your hair? I had to, it was a low ponytail. And, you know, there was, like, makeup to downplay feminine features and stuff. So the role was not only challenging because you had to become a man, so to speak, Yes. but it was also very physically challenging. Yes. Uh, Richard III has a, famously he had scoliosis and a limp and a bum hand. So uh, this, this, this was great. I got this fantastic physical challenge of like, okay, so you gotta get from here to there, you know, but you have scoliosis and a limp. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I had. Did you like put a tack in your shoe or anything like that to people. try to I had get to be a like, limb? Does this look natural or do I just look like I'm acting like I have a limb? Uh -huh. You know, is this like the, the bad, <laughs> I'm yeah. sick? You we know, all kind know of. you're acting. Right, fine. right. So I did, um, I walked around with like one high heel and like one flat shoe and I was like, okay, this is how it feels in my pelvis. And you know, this is the relationship of my pelvis to my spine. And I got a little into it. <laughs> But it was, it was well, that's very... what you have to do to really modify your body for a role like that. Yeah, and uh, another thing about that, Tony Pisculli, the director of the show and founder of the festival, is also a um, pretty amazing fight choreographer. So he insisted, of course, on having these really gnarly fights in his show. So I, I had, you know, and it was set kind of in a gangster sort of world. So there was this one point where I had a gun on the floor, a gun in my belt. I was carrying a cane because I had a sword concealed in the cane. So there was like the blade of the cane, the, the scabbard part of the cane, um, and two guns that I had to pick up and deal with and do hand-to-hand -hand combat. I was also <laughs> wearing full leather gloves, so I couldn't feel anything. <laughs> And there was one night I actually pooped my gun. Like, the gun... <laughs> pooped your gun, huh? Yeah, so, I don't know this term. Okay, Tell me it's, more. <laughs> it's, I'm euphemizing. It's, okay. Anyway, yeah, so, it, so the gun was, like, tucked into my belt. Uh -huh. And I had to do this move where I twisted. The gun slipped down from my belt, and it didn't fall down onto the stage, which was great because it didn't clatter, right? That was nice. But I also had to deal with a gun slowly working its way down my <laughs> pant leg for the duration of a scene in which I was supposed to be kind of... I mean, you know, a cool shoot 'em up bad guy. And you pooped a gun. And I pooped. <laughs> it didn't actually fall out on stage, which was nice. 
So that probably helped with your limp, maybe. It, trying it to... actually, the limp was actually <laughs> on the other leg. So oh. it wasn't, it was bad, but good. But it paid I off. Don't know. You got the Po'okela award for mm -hmm. this yes, role. Yes, I did. And that's like the cream of the crop award that you can get in Hawaii, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's so, a good one. It's a big one. I'm not even going to ask you how you feel because I'm sure you've had to tell everybody a million times. I, you know, I'm grateful. It was a great opportunity. I will say this, though. I got leading female in a play. Leading female to play a male. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's... I went home and I scratched out the F-E. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so at the same time that you were in that play, mm -hmm. you were also part of another play that you are also held oh a gosh. principal role for. You did your homework, didn't you? I did my homework, <laughs> lady. Okay. Two scripts in your head. Uh, yes. Who do you think you are? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, working actor. <laughs> this is what we do. Um, that was, it was actually a little easier than it might have been to differentiate because one was Shakespearean mm -hmm. and the language wasn't modified. It was, it was a tremendous amount of lines, you know. Uh, uh, that wasn't the easy part. But, but the other play was in Pigeon. And I'm originally from Wahiwa. I, I was doing a play in the language that I was kind of grew up speaking, you know. Uh -huh. And I was doing this other very different character in a very different language. So it wasn't like I get the two confused. Also, one was a woman, you know. So they were very, very different. So in my head, I could kind of compartmentalize, like, okay, you know, this is, my, this is the way I hold my body and this is the way I project my voice for this character and then you just kind of flip the switch and so was it just kind of a fun challenge for you uh no I cried at Zippy's oh. <laughs> over my coffee like I can't do this right and um, then you get through it and then with the um the reviews of that there's something crazy ended up happening with one of the adjudicators saying that oh one of the reviewers yeah 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 the, so, the pigeon play that you were in what was yes the name of it that? was Saturday Night at the Pahala Theater by Lois San Yamanaka and that's, Lois Ann Yamanaka is a, is a beautiful, beautiful writer. She's fairly um, prominent, actually, on the national literature stage. And she um, released her first published work, which is a collection of poems, uh, same name as the play, Saturday Night at the Pahala Theater, uh, for theatrical production by Kumukuhua Theater. So this is a groundbreaking a literary work that turned into quite a groundbreaking theatrical work. And there, were, there was a, one reviewer in particular, um, and if you remember who it was, you know, you remember the voice of just the vitriol. Uh, it, it, uh, it was called profane and disgusting and a bastardization of the original work, which is hilarious, but, I mean, when you think about it, because if you saw the production and you read the original poems, they were verba the text went from page to stage unaltered. We maintained the punctuation even, like, if you could hear a comma, it would have been in there, you know. So there's it a, was word perfect. There's some sort of a disparity between the people who are judging the works in theater on the island that maybe don't really have an understanding of the culture or really know what they're talking about. Let's just say that. Sure. Can I say that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very interesting because at the same time that you're being given the award for the best female actress in Hawaii, you're also being yeah. called, like, the worst ever. So that, yeah. at the exact same time, that must have just felt like being... Oh, that was great. As an actor, <laughs> that was just great. That was like, you know, you've really made it as an artist. You know, if everybody likes you, you get kind of, like, weirded out about that. You like need you, to, can't, you need to mix it up. Somebody's <laughs> full of something, you know what I mean? And if everybody hates you, well, you should probably change your profession. But if, you've get, if you get both, and they're both very strong reactions, you know that you're hitting nerves. And, and that's, what you go, that's what you aim for. That's uh, that is what I, as an artist, look for. I look for a human connection. And if that means a positive connection of things that we enjoy, that we want to celebrate, awesome. And if that means that sometimes that I touch a nerve that doesn't want to be touched and there's a knee-jerk reaction against it, I say that's valuable as well. That is a very Sorry. good point, and I really That's art, I man. love the way you, yeah. I love the way you just put that because <laughs> I've been in some theater productions where people have been like, "Oh, what is that?" You know, and it's just this insane, really unique work that is not something you can define. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, both of you guys. Yay. It's been a great thank show. You. Let's talk about Rain Gardens more sometime in the future. <laughs> and thank you to Garden Steph Music awesome. for playing our <laughs> intro and outro. Let's throw it away, Steph. <laughs>